class of oscillatory phenomenon. What is it like to do this? Right? And we're going to see it everywhere. Even when, and, and you can really observe this when you're driving, and then we're going to we're gonna get into wave equations. The idea of when you're driving down a highway and you hit a kind of a, a backed up section of traffic, what, what's happening is that the guys in the front stopped, and that forced you to stop, and that forced the car behind you to stop, and you propagated a wave backwards. But still, we can describe this an entire large set of a seemingly unrelated physical phenomenon. We're not talking about this single clock. We're not talking about this single pendulum. We're not talking about this single cable. We're talking about a whole variety of phenomenon and just writing down this equation. Um, and I think that's a really neat thing. But this is a phenomenally hard thing to do. It's hard to see all of these classes of phenomenon. It's hard to see me throw this piece of chalk in the air and extract the equation which describes it, right? So what we're going to spend the rest of today talking about is, is not how do we go from Apple or how do we go from the equation to figuring out, well, what does it mean, right? And it's, it's like the same question of does x squared, does the equation y equals x squared, does that really mean the graph of x squared, right? And you're going to see that, no, it doesn't always. It can, it can mean a whole variety of things. I don't even have to graph it. I could be talking about a different domain and all sorts of different, different phenomenon. But it's going to be the relationship of these different ideas that we're going to be talking about. And uh, we've got some great things to show for you. And for the most part, I'm going to be handing this. Sorry, yes, Latif. When, like, isn't it, like, when you see all these similarities between different um, structures, can we like, uh, make this stuff up? So are we making stuff up? Yeah. Yes, we are making stuff up because we're only modeling things here, right? Like if you actually then measured, you know, does, does the rate of change or the rate of change of the angle, this cable, um, always equal minus sine of the angle? Um, and for this system, obviously, no, right? Because, I mean, look, it's bending, right? It's got all sorts of weird elastic properties. It's actually, the rod's not stiff. It is actually flexing about and doing all sorts of crazy things. Um, and, you know, this isn't a massless rod here with just a big ball on the end. It's, this thing's got almost as much mass as, as the end. Um, so, no. But the fact that we can model most of the behavior, most of the salient features of the phenomenon in a rather simple way is one of the remarkable things about science and about mathematics. Um, so just to kind of convince you that complexity can come out of simplicity, you might say, OK, well, doing this isn't really that complex. I mean, I probably could have figured out a simple way to describe it. Go ahead. Does that show something about the universe or something about it? Because you see, maybe the universe is doing the same thing as more complicated and gets shown in higher degree. OK. So Latif says, maybe the universe is doing something different, and we're just showing how it can be done simpler? That's a good question. But the problem is, is that the most we can do, the way that we fundamentally think as humans, since we're such simple creatures and we're not the universe, well, we're part of it, um, is that we have to be able to simplify our phenomenon in ways like this. And if you ever end up reading a book by Seth Lloyd called Programming the Universe, you'll say that the universe itself is a quantum computer carrying out quantum operations all the time. And maybe somewhere in there, at the you know, beginning of the universe, uh, there, there was a monkey typing away instructions into the, into the com quantum computer that is the universe that said, OK, well, we're going to let force always equal mass times acceleration, for those of you who have done physics. Um, and we're also going to let this and this, and we're going to um, and this was all hard-coded in there. But the issue is we don't know that. We don't know what happened exactly at the beginning of the universe. We don't know how exactly the universe operates. There's still mysteries out there. And the fact that we can go from throwing this piece of chalk to understanding what's the law which governs that is really a remarkable achievement of hum humankind. Um, but I want to really hammer home this idea that that complex phenomenon have a, um, 
have a very a simple underlying feature. And this is going to relate to some different ideas of information theory, which I might periodically pop in and, and invade uh, on Cur Curran's time here. But for the most part, he's going to take over the show now. Um, but should we take a quick break? Yeah, All right, so let's come back in probably five minutes and you know refresh ourselves. So and then Kern will take over. All right. Okay, so I'm going to start talking. Uh, so this is the Sierpinski triangle, which I talked about last time. <clears throat> and there are a, a, a lot of different ways to get to this shape. So he's talking about how do you go from, from seeing this shape to understanding the process of how to do it. It's, it's not like an easy thing. Um, this is what's sort of unique to humans. We can step back and say like, OK, what's going on here? What kind of more generalized process might lead to this thing? So I'm going to talk about a bunch of different systems, uh, Lindenmeyer systems and cellular automata, and a, a bunch of examples of each. Um, so first of all, I'll just do <coughs> an example of a Lindenmeyer system. A Lindenmeyer system is when you start with a string. A string is just a list of, of symbols, like characters. And you apply these rewrite rules, and you have this grammar. So each, each one of the symbols goes to some other set of symbols when you rewrite it. So I'll just do an example. Um, <clears throat> we start with F. And we have these rules. F goes to, well, this means it's a string when I put it in quotes. F goes to, mm -hmm. So whenever we have this symbol f, we replace it with f plus f minus minus f plus. And like, does this mean anything to you guys? Probably not. So let's just go through it. And so f, when we apply the rule for the first time, what we get is this. We get f plus f minus minus f plus. So here's when we really get to the rec recursive nature of Lindenmeyer systems. We feed this string back into the rule. And f so for each f here, we replace it with that. So this f, the first, well, the first f becomes f plus f minus minus f plus. So that's what this first f becomes. Then we add plus. The second f, and we do that whole string of stuff again, minus, and then another repetition of that, and then plus. And we just keep doing this. Um, and now let's recall the Koch curve from last time. What we do is, the first thing, we have this, just a line. And we apply this rule that says we uh, make this little notch in it. So we get to this. And then we apply that same rule to each one of these things. right? So what, is, what does this mean? Does anybody have any idea what this means, this, these, these symbols? So the meaning comes out of the isomorphism, like he said. How do you interpret them? So f, in this case, um, F stands for go going forward.